Waco, Texas, located just 95 miles south of Dallas, bore witness to one of its most chilling scenes in all of its history. And it's all thanks to this man here. So prepare yourselves, because this is a tough one. Viewer discretion is advised. Born as Vernon Howell, who was then later David Koresh, due to a court filed main change in 1990, was born August 17, 1959 in Houston, Texas. In David's early years as a child, he seemed to struggle a bit with the studies due to dyslexia. This would then lead him to being placed in multiple special head classes and would eventually hammer down on his self-esteem. David's mother, Bonnie Sue Clark, which was 14 at the time of David's birth, would eventually leave David in the hands of his grandmother at the age of four. Bonnie would then later return to David just three years later with her new husband. David's biological father was never really in the picture. In fact, he didn't meet his father until he was 17. Being that that it is, David would soon begin attending his mother's church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here, David would run into some trouble. He would eventually proclaim that he had received a sign from God, telling him that the pastor's 12-year-old daughter was for him to have as a wife which he proudly announced to the pastor and multiple members of the church. Now, I'd like for you guys to know that at the time in David's life, he is 19 years old, and prior to this, he also has a child with a 15-year-old. Now, the pastor, like any sane person would be, was furious with David. He was then swiftly exiled from the church and scolded for his proclaims. Now we fast forward to 1983, just three years later after his expelment, David moves to Waco, Texas to join a new congregation called Branch Davidians. Now, this is not to be confused with his old church, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. The Branch Davidians is like an offshoot group of the main church. This group was started and founded by a man named Benjamin Rodden. Benjamin was known to preach catchy sermons and believed to possess the gift of prophecy. Benjamin was actually expelled from the main branch due to his sermons or preachings being heavily influenced by the beliefs of the Shepherd's Rod. The Shepherd's Rod is also an offshoot group being founded by Victor Hutif in the 1930s, which, as you guessed it, Victor himself was expelled from the Seventh-day Adventist Church and was also a self-proclaimed prophet. Noticing a pattern? Now back to David. He joins the branch Davidians in 1983 when... At the time, Benjamin's wife, Lewis, was currently in charge of leading the church following Benjamin's death. Lewis didn't see her son, George Rodden, fit to be the next prophet and speaker of their congregation. Now, this is where David comes into play and begins to make his mark within the branch. Lewis actually accepts David with open arms and in some ways actually begins to groom him to become the next prophet of the church. Lewis allows David to preach sermons and to teach his own teachings the way he saw fit. And as a sudden note, David marries 14-year-old Rachel Jones, and then shortly after this marriage, he received a vision from God, a vision that showed he needed to take more women as wives. This was obviously not taken by, the, by George. It would eventually lead to some division amongst the members. I would also like to tell you guys that George had the majority of this favor and David at the time had around 25 followers. So after some time in 1984, George was said to have escorted David and his dedicated followers off of the compound known as Mount Carmel Center. George escorted David out at gunpoint. It is said that David and his followers had no choice but to relocate to Palestine, Texas, which is roughly 100 miles east of Waco. While David and his group spent this time in Palestine, they adjusted their lives to living in makeshift tents, pallet homes and a bus. David also takes this time to recruit more followers. Two years later, then 1986, Louise passes away, leaving the Mount Carmel Center to her son, George. David and his followers decide to try and reclaim the center, but little did they know George had actually dug up the grave of Anna Hughes prior and would then proceed to challenge David to resurrect the poor girl to prove which of the two were a true prophet. David refused the challenge and made the local police aware of where George had done. 
the response given by the authorities was that they would enact Thomas' accusation without proof. David and his followers responded by gathering together while armed and marched to the center with intentions of photographing the corpse. Reports say that the Davidians didn't even bring a camera, so this weakened David's argument. Nevertheless, this would soon escalate to a shootout between the Branch Davidians and George. Ultimately, the authorities were soon involved, forcing David and his followers to surrender. While George suffered from a few minor gunshot wounds, George was eventually jailed for his foul language in a courtroom, and as well for living on the sinner's grounds when ordered not to do so. Eventually, George would commit a heinous crime in 1989. He carried out the murder of Wayne Del Adair. He was convinced that he was sent by the Branch Davidians' cult as a hitman. George was confined to a psychiatric hospital and eventually passed away from a heart attack. Due to George owing lots of unpaid taxes on the compound, the Davidians who followed David were able to raise enough money to eventually claim the Carmel Center for themselves. This compound would now be the Davidians' new home for religious activities and furthermore for their suspicious cult endeavors. David believed that he would leave his congregation as the true messenger of God and he taught his followers that only he could be in direct contact with God, and at times he was given special instructions on what God wanted of his people. The Davidians were taught that their group specifically were God's chosen people. This formed a tied net community amongst the members and convinced them of David's holiness. His followers truly believed that David Koresh's words were God's words, and that David would lead them to salvation. Mr. Koresh would preach heavily about the end times, they would soon lead his followers to believe that he was going to be the gateway and reason for this new age Armageddon. That was soon to unfold. He stated that he was the only Lamb of God and was granted power to open the seven seals that would lead to the apocalypse. Furthermore, at some point in David's teachings, he was known to tell his followers that the government that ruled over them were the modern-day Babylonians, basically the Davidian enemies and that if a Davidian was to be eliminated by a Babylonian, they would earn their ticket into heaven. Koresh proceeded even further to admit to a dream he had, and in this dream it is foretold that a large number of Davidians would perish in a great fire, a fire caused by the Babylonians. This death by fire would also be an honorable and acceptable death that would fulfill their dreams of entering the gates of heaven. By this point into David's life, he was convinced that he was the modern-day Messiah. Now, with that being said, he also believed that he was to father as many children as he could. This is what he preached and believed, resulting in 16 children with multiple wives. These wives that David acquired they were amongst the followers and were also engaged in their own relationships. But with his followers being as dedicated as they were, Husbands of the branch happily gave permission for their wives and David to engage in these sorts of activities. The Davidians in their compound would soon meet their unfortunate fates. The President of the United States at the time, Bill Clinton, as well as the FBI and ATF, would all soon be involved in the attempted capture of David Koresh. This would result in a 51-day standoff between the Branch Davidians and the federal agents. This standoff, like most of David's teachings, was very controversial. There was lots of back and forth about how this standoff should have panned out and that it was carried out poorly on the government's end. But at the end, people made the decisions they believed they had to make. So what happened? Well, the ATF were the first to get involved with the attempted capture of David and his followers. They were tipped off from a source that had informed them about the weapons and explosives that the branch was believed to have in their possession, as well as the possible drug trafficking that allegedly was taking place within the branch. Not only was this enough cause for concern, but federal agents were also informed about the abuse that David was committing towards his children and other children within the branch. This essentially set off the ATF and the siege began. To make matters worse, a lot of news and radio stations held constant contact with Koresh up to a certain point into the raid. They seemed to play an empathy role for the branch and the children with them. 
The ATF wasn't pleased. The ATF arrived and claimed they heard gunshots coming from within the compound. They returned fire, resulting in David being hit in the stomach and hand. Both the ATF group and the Davidians suffered casualties from their first encounter, with the ATF having four and the branch having five. Shortly after this, the ATF was then able to establish contact with Koresh, but due to the casualties suffered from the ATF, the FBI now steps in and takes over the entire operation. The FBI's goal was to try and establish some negotiations amongst the members of the branch in order to end the siege swiftly. This did not go as planned. Like I said earlier, Koresh had constant contact with the media. The FBI seemed put a stop to this due to having a negative impact on the siege. Nevertheless, the FBI negotiated the release of 19 children from the compound. Some children were as young as five months and as old as 12 years old. There were various audio and video recordings being passed to and from the branch and FBI. One of the videos set by the Davidians showed the women, children, and men inside the compound not being held hostage, but instead were actually choosing to stand by their Messiah during this hectic siege. Both the FBI and ATF grew frustrated. David would constantly make requests like discussing the Bible with Philip Arnold, who was a Bible scholar who stood on the side of the siege, and he would also request for more time before he had to surrender. This would lead to divisions amongst the federal agents. One side was wanted to negotiate and please David's demands, while the other side urged to act with brute force before things got too out of him. Eventually, they would result to brute force. Power was cut to the building, Water and food supply also dwindled. In time, David would order 11 of his followers to surrender to authorities, and so they did. When authorities noticed that none were children, it shocked investigators due to the convictions some followers still had towards David. Soon David would send out a letter with demands, stating that he would like for the biblical scholars to have a copy of his manuscripts. And once these scholars have them at hand, he would then surrender himself. This excited, but mostly irritated, the FBI, and most saw this as David buying more time. The FBI reacts with more brute force. The day that the siege ends finally arrives. The compound is bombarded with tear gas, and the squashes that were surrounding the compound were ordered to not shoot, only to increase the amount of tear gas used. This was, of course, a way to force out the members without any serious harm. The Davidians, on the other hand, react to this by taking aim and firing at the agents that began to close in on them, when all of a sudden multiple parts of the compound began to burst into flames, almost engulfing the entire building. The fire of the compound is heavily debated about even to this day, and it's about how the fire started. Federal agents claim the fires were intentionally caused from inside, while surviving branch members claim the fire started for the bombardment of tear gas. Nevertheless, the fire was spreading fast when the building quickly deteriorated. Nine branch members escaped the burning building while the remaining perished by fire, collapse of rubble, or self-inflicted robes. Close to 80 members perished on the final day of the siege, some of which were children. With David being amongst the dead, his body was discovered with a gunshot wound to the head, laying beside his right-hand man, Steve Schneider who is believed to be the one that carried out the death of his own Messiah.